I would like to introduce you to Jean Barry. She is the chair of our Lyme disease subcommittee, and she will be hitting this off for this evening. Does anyone need a card or pencil while we're at it? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a very um, hot topic in our area, particularly Middlesex County and along the Cape and Islands. Um, and Carlisle itself is actually considered a bit of a hot zone. And um, if any of you are familiar with the UMass tick testing program, you can actually go and enter our zip code and see what percentage of the ticks come back positive for certain pathogens. So interestingly enough, just before I came here, I didn't really prepare any remarks. I just figured I'd throw a few little tidbits of fun ideas out for you and then introduce the speakers and we can get along with the, get, get on with the evening. Um, just this afternoon, I went back and put in a couple different dates for Carlisle. For Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease for most cases, there are other Borrelia species that do that as well. But in our area, just in Carlisle, approximately 35 to 45% of the ticks are positive. And this is on average. If you start putting in different dates, you might see lower numbers, you might see higher numbers. It seems to kind of bounce back and forth in that range. So when you are bitten by a tick, you have probably about a 50% chance of actually getting Lyme disease. We're not really sure about the transmission rate though, so that's, that's a big question. Borrelia um, uh, babesia microti, about 12 to 15% bounces around that, that range. And anaplasma is about 10% of the ticks turn up positive in our area. Um, so those are all very serious infections. They affect everyone a little bit differently. Those who have a suppressed immune system, who are undergoing treatment for other conditions, sometimes have a more fulminant course and much more serious condition. So anyway, we are not here tonight to talk about human beings, per se. We are here to talk about pets and mosquitoes and ticks. And tonight we have with us um, both Matt Osborne and um, Charles Bradley. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to uh, Matt Osborne. He's got a master's public health. In, um, he's an epidemiologist with the Mass Department of Public Health where he oversees the epidem epidemiology programs, zoonotic disease project, and the arbovirus surveillance program. He has been involved with mosquito and tick-borne disease for more than 15 years working in field laboratory and epidemiology settings. Matt has developed vector-borne disease health education initiatives to reduce the incidence of tick-borne disease in children and the elderly. He holds a master's in public health from the UMass. Um, and then I will give a brief introduction uh, to Charles when it is his turn to speak. So, Matt, I actually have my glasses on. There you are. I'm All right. Ready Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay if I stand here? Great. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come out tonight. This is something I'm passionate about. I've been passionate about uh, mosquito-borne disease for longer than I've been passionate about uh, tick-borne disease. But my viewpoints on the importance of tick-borne disease have really dramatically evolved. Uh, we, I focus a lot of my effort on mosquito-borne disease during the summer. But realistically, the burden of uh, zoonotic disease in Massachusetts is tick-borne. And so we're going to kind of frame a little bit of what we talk about tonight, and I hope everyone can see the screen, but if you can, I'll talk about it. Uh, and how few cases we have of mosquito-borne disease, and although serious, uh, showcase how many cases of tick-borne disease we have. So in Massachusetts, we have uh, two main arboviral mosquito-borne diseases that most people have actually heard of, eastern equine encephalitis, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the mosquitoes, not too, too much. And West Nile virus, which I think everybody in the room has heard of. But Eastern Equine Encephalitis has been around since, the, or known about since the 1930s and likely been around long since before that. We have 51 different species of mosquitoes in Massachusetts. And of these, only about 14 or 15 species actually spread disease in, in the state. In, in your lifetime, you may actually see about 30 or 40 of these species. I've seen most of them. But um, there are two different types of cycles going on that spread these diseases. One is bird to bird, and we call that the enzootic uh, cycle, and there are enzootic vectors. I'll show you a picture of the mosquitoes, you know, really cool. 
Uh, Culicida melanura is actually a really fascinating mosquito, which I won't have time to get into today. But then we have epizootic vectors. Those are the mosquitoes that actually bite the birds and the people. So they're taking the virus from the birds and then they're transmitting it to you. Uh, and then for West Nile virus, we have mosquitoes that are really those that are most associated with activities around your home. These are container breeding species. Uh, these are actually mosquitoes that you can do something to control. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, so we really look at Culex mosquitoes, and you know during the summer we're talking about Culex mosquitoes. And last year was a very serious West Nile virus year. We had uh, 49 human cases, uh, but we'll couch that with how many uh, Lyme disease cases we had. And then at the bottom I wrote down Jamestown Canyon virus. This is a virus we've known about for a very long time, but we really haven't had the means to test for the virus. And over the last couple of years, we um, CDC brought on a new testing tool and we started to find cases of this disease. So there are certainly a lot of other arboviral diseases out there uh, that we don't see too much of, but certainly Eastern and West Nile, those are our two main uh, mosquito-borne diseases. And this slide, anyone who's in the back of the room, you guys are out of luck unless your eyes, my eyesight is terrible and I'm standing like 10 feet away from this and I can't see it. So let me just tell you what it says. We had a really bad West Nile virus year last year. Uh, uh, we had 579 West Nile virus samples, and that was uh, tested out of about six, uh, about 6,000 samples. So we had almost a, what we would look at as a 10% positivity rate, which is huge. We don't normally see that. It runs anywhere from 3 to 5% in a really bad year. Uh, we had uh, two triple E uh, isolates in mosquitoes, which is very, very low, and that was fantastic. And for human activity, we had 49 human cases that we're aware of, and we are only picking up the most serious of these cases. So think that there are a lot of other people walking around out there with West Nile virus that's undiagnosed, but we still had 49. That is our largest year since this disease uh, emerged in Massachusetts in 2001. Uh, our prior record, I believe, was 35. Somebody educated me the other day that I might be wrong, but I think it was 35. Um, 400 and 434 human specimens tested. So again, a little over 10% uh, uh, of what we tested was positive. So a lot of positivity. And then with very, very few animals, there are vaccines, and I think uh, my colleague in the room knows more about the vaccines than I do, but there are vaccines for uh, horses, so they're no longer really good sentinel animals for us. They're surviving, which is fantastic. Uh, but we only had two West Nile cases in horses and one uh, horse death in tri for Tripoli. And so what my program does, I, I hold kind of dual roles at the State Health Department, and that happens over time. They just keep giving you more and more work. Um, and you know, they can pay you less, so it's really a great opportunity for them. Um, but I love, I love what I do, so I'm happy to run the Arboverse uh, program we actually go out and we set traps throughout Massachusetts. We have historical sites that we've operated since the 1950s, and we collect literally the same data at, at exactly the same sites so that we can show the progression of eastern equine encephalitis since, it start, since we had large outbreaks in the 50s. And what we've seen recently is that the outbreaks are becoming uh, more frequent in time and in some cases more severe. So we're really not certain as to why that is, and we're looking forward to the next season, and I'll give you some hints as to what might happen. Uh, but I gave up long time ago telling you what's going to happen because I've been wrong. Um, I don't know. But uh, we test uh, specimens for eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus at the State Laboratory Institute where I work. Uh, we test them in real time uh, through molecular methods, so PCR, so we have information within about 24 hours. It's a really, really fast system. Uh, and then when the data comes in, my other side of the program, the epidemiology program, we take all of that data and we assign risk. So we're putting out risk maps to the public, we're putting out messaging to the public, you know, we keep telling you to use repellent and we actually mean use repellent. Um, I'm much better about it since I've had Lyme disease. I use repellent a lot. Uh, but we also communicate with our local health agents and the, our mosquito control projects and they take action based on that. And these are just some of the traps. So if you ever encounter a weird box in the woods and you're wondering what it is, just leave it alone. Um, it costs money and time. And believe me, people disturb them and they're curious. But these traps collect uh, mosquitoes for West Nile virus. 
and that actually that is actually you can't see it with the pointer but that little box down there, it's actually literally a wooden box, and it works really well to collect the species of mosquitoes that likes to rest inside of it. So we come along with a vacuum cleaner and we suck them out. It's a, actually a highly efficient uh, trap, and it costs almost no money. Um, we like to do things for very little money. Um, this is a trap that we use for eastern equine encephalitis uh, surveillance. It's actually been in use since the 1950s, almost unchanged. Uh, it has a light bulb and we can attach any attractant we want to it and we've caught up to 40,000 mosquitoes in one trap and we sort every single mosquito, every one. We count every one and we maintain a database of it. So we really try not to catch 40,000 mosquitoes. Uh, so these are um, some of our past staff and they're working in the laboratory identifying our mosquitoes and then in our uh, testing units where we're th they're actually going through doing the PCR work. And so for Eastern Equine Encephalitis, it is known as the most severe arboviral disease in the US. And unfortunately, we have it, and we've had it for a long time. It has an incubation period of anywhere from two to 10 days from the time of the bite of the infected mosquito. And the symptoms get progressively worse if you um, exhibit symptoms, most people do. Uh, they, it starts out with headache, high fever, nausea, potentially uh, lethargy, and then seizures, coma, and, and possibly death. Uh, in Massachusetts, we do have a high rate of mortality for this disease. Uh, two of every three individuals uh, either will succumb or they'll suffer lifelong neurological damage. So it is a very, very serious disease, but it's an extremely rare disease. In the worst years that we have it, we're looking at six or seven human cases. So these half of those individuals may succumb to the disease, but still we're talking about six or seven people. We take it very seriously, but as we move into tick-borne disease, you'll see the differences. And this is Culicida melanura, a very plain brown mosquito. Um, if you don't know anything about mosquitoes, this won't mean anything to you, but it has a really, again, I can't use the pointer. It has a really long proboscis. That's how it feeds on uh, birds. And it has an ad adapted proboscis so it can get through the feathers. It's a really cool mosquito. Um, this is its habitat. Uh, th this is a cedar and maple swamp. And it's, it's actually a really interesting mosquito. I'm going to spend way too much time on this. I know I am. Um, it lays its eggs under the root system of trees. And, they are, and the larvae develop under the root systems of trees, so if you're trying to control this mosquito, you can't because you can't get the material under the roots of trees. You can only control the adult phase of the mosquito. Um, and this really beautiful mosquito here, which looks terrible, and this is fresh and new, this is a species called Cochalotidia perturbans. I guarantee you that no one in this room is gonna run into Culicida melanura, but everybody will run into that species. It is one of the most aggressive biters we have, and it's also one of the best vectors for eastern equine we have in the state. It feeds both on birds and mosquitoes, I'm sorry, both on birds and mammals. So that's, um, that's where the danger comes in. If, you're, if you just feed on birds, then you can't transmit to humans. If you just feed on humans, then you're not picking up the virus. This female uh, feeds on both, and she lives for a really long time. So the, the deal is, the longer your lifespan is, the more opportunity you have to pick up the viruses. Unfortunately, she lives for a really long time. We're talking about three months. So that's, in mosquito days, that's old. And by the end of her life, she looks like, she actually looks worse than this. Um, this is the habitat for Cochlotidia perturbans. So if you can remember that, just let it roll off the tongue, Cochlotidia perturbans. Um, it, it's, it is, again, I can't get into it because I don't have enough time. It is one of the most fascinating uh, mosquito species. It's a cattail marsh mosquito. It breeds in this area. But actually, right across, if you look at the uh, forest, that is a cedar and maple swamp. So these species are right on top of each other. And when the viruses come out in these swamps, they're in proximity to pick it up. And that's why we see transmission. So unfortunately, Tripoli is mostly an eastern disease. And Massachusetts and Florida really are vying for the role of having the most cases. Um, our land size compared to Florida is ridiculously small. But we actually have more cases than Florida does because we have more habitat. Uh, also, much tighter population density here in the state. For Triple E last year, and again, this is going to be hard to see, but anything that you see in red, those are uh, mosquitoes. 
Let's see, so this, we had a detection in September of mosquitoes, and we had another detection in September, but we also had an interesting detection of a wild turkey which succumbed to Triple E. Uh, that's not normal. We don't normally see wild birds succumbing because they're very used to this virus. They've adapted to it. Uh, so we're not really sure what to make of that. And then at the very, very end of the season, really late, we had a horse that passed away from, um, was euthanized for eastern equine encephalitis. And what's really happened is the mosquito suffered from the drought we had several years back and is now completely rebounded and is now set up things where we had pretty much a, you know, for us New Englanders, it was somewhat of a mild winter. Uh, a lot of these mosquitoes survive, so it could go either way, but we're really set to have kind of a difficult Eastern year. West Nile virus is a much less severe disease, but it's so much more common. Uh, the incubation is three to 15 days following the time of the bite, and the symptoms for those who have them, 80% are going to be asymptomatic. So there are people in this room that have likely had West Nile virus that never knew it. Uh, only 20% of our cases have West Nile fever, and most of those, if you're a younger, healthier individual, I am, you know, when I was younger and healthier, I would just, that would not be a big deal to me. I might not see treatment. It doesn't last very long, so you think, you know, 20s, 30s, people are just ignoring this. What we're really picking up are those cases that are neuroinvasive. So those are the encephalitis and meningitis cases, the people that need to be hospitalized for their illness. Uh, but the nice thing about, if there is a nice thing, only uh, less than 1% of cases actually develop neuroinvasive disease, and the mortality rate is very, very low. So we're really talking about people of a very advanced age who are succumbing to this disease. Uh, this is the species in Massachusetts that's primarily responsible. This is a container breeding species. It's called Culex pipiens. And it's actually known as the northern house mosquito. And it, it's named that because it's associated with our activity. It follows us around. It breeds in places like this. And with eastern equine encephalitis vectors, those are woodland species. You and I, we can't do anything about really knocking them down. But with this, we actually can go out and turn over containers and make sure our yards are as clean as they can be. This is what West Nile virus looked like last year with a really intense year. And you can see, again, I, can, I keep forgetting that it doesn't work. There's some sort of magic behind uh, whenever the pointer goes on there, it just gets lost inside. Uh, but if you look at the areas of red, that's um, high population density and a lot of activity. So those areas where there's enough population and, and, and very tight quarters, you'll see more transmission. Out in the western portions of the state, population density starts to taper off, and it's harder for mosquitoes to actually find people to transmit to. So I really wanted to just couch this. I wanted to really give you an idea that in our worst years, we're seeing 50, 60 cases of mosquito-borne disease. In a normal year, we're seeing thousands of cases of tick-borne disease. And the burden of this disease is only going up. I don't have time to talk about all of the tick-borne diseases that we have in Massachusetts, so I'm going to focus on the big names that we're all familiar with and the lesser ones that you typically don't see and hopefully no one will ever contract. We're not going to focus too much on those. So I'll talk about Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis. I'll talk about Powassan because I know it's been in the news a lot lately. And then another one, Borrelia miyamotoi, that's also garnered some attention recently as well. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is exceptionally rare in Massachusetts. I've only run across two cases in the entire time I've been with the State Health Department. Uh, tularemia is a very significant and damaging disease. Um, it's on the Cape and the Islands, uh, rare from transmission from ticks, but it can happen. There are other mechanisms for its transmission. And then a relichiosis, which is very rare in the state as well. So uh, my colleague is going to show you some better pictures than I have. So I'm going to let him talk about some of the. He, he has some really nice pictures. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to let him talk about some of the differences between them. So I'm not going to steal his thunder. But what I wanted to get at was um, the shape of the ticks, uh, the size of the ticks. So, and which of the ticks are the most deadly? Which of the ticks are the ones that you really have to look out for? And what you're gonna keep hearing me say is the deer tick, the deer tick, the deer tick. 
That's the tick that you need to be on the lookout for. There are other ticks in Massachusetts. You need to be on the lookout for the deer tick. If you get a whole bunch of dog ticks on you, it's actually a good thing because you're looking for deer ticks at least. Uh, deer ticks have a reddish abdomen, the adults, but the nymphs, so if you look at the one all the way over where you have the pointer, um, that's the adult. Go two to your right, that's the nymph. So the nymphs are absolutely tiny. We believe that the, that the majority of disease, especially in mid early to mid-season, that's driven by the nymphs. Uh, this is partially the fact that they're dropping off infected mice, and the other part is the size. So they're already infected, but it's that size. I've had Lyme disease twice. Um, I had the erythema migrans rash, both on my thighs. One would think if I was going to spot a tick, that would be a really good place to do it. I never saw the tick. It, it came at the right time of year, so it had to have been nymphs. Um, the adults are about the size of a sesame seed, and if you look on the bottom, if you can actually see that, that's a realistic size perspective of what an adult and a nymph look like. So really, really tiny, which means that you can't solely rely on tick checks alone to catch all of these. There have to be other tools that you use in your arsenal to make sure that you limit your exposure to these ticks. And again, I'm not going to steal because I don't think this picture is as good as what you have. But look at the size difference above dog tick and below deer tick. The dog tick is twice the size of the deer tick. The dog tick is much easier to identify. It's actually, it's striated, it's, an, it's a much larger tick. And the deer tick is, is quite a bit harder to find. So where do they live? Well, in Massachusetts, pretty much everywhere. Um, they live on your property. But what they need is humid environment. So there are certain areas that they cannot cross. And if you maintain your personal environment and you're aware of what you're walking into, it's going to give you a net benefit to limit your exposure to these ticks. They really need shaded, damp areas so that they can stay humid. If they cross a lawn with a lot of solar radiation, they're going to dry out. They're going to die. They're not going to make the trip. So if you set your lawn up correctly and you set your personal spaces up correctly, you're going to limit the spread of those ticks in your environment. And it turns out that your house is probably one of the riskiest places that you have. That's where you spend the most time. So if you have a fence line, well, that's shaded. At some part of the day, that's shaded. That's where they're going to be. So these are the areas that you have to go out into your yard and say, where is it most likely? I live on a wetlands. My whole yard is tick habitat, but I know what to look for and how to set up my property. I know what to keep away from my house. Um, leaf litter, too. Leaf litter is actually a big problem for us. So in the fall, we see a little uptick in our number of cases. And why is that? Well, everyone's cleaning up their yard, and they're standing in the leaves. And believe me, I do the same thing. I got my boots on, I'm out there. And then I lift up my pant legs, and I got ticks feeding on my ankles. Um, people are standing in the leaf litter, and that's something you need to be aware of because that's moist, they're in there. So it's all of these little things that you might not think of as being risks. So when are they active today? They're active right now. Um, people tend not to think about that. They, th they think summer equals ticks. Any temperature above 41 degrees Fahrenheit, they're out there, they're active. Below in the leaf litter, they main some activity level. Uh, the nymphs are active right now. They'll remain active into going into July, and then the adults are active as well. But there are both life stages out there as well. I did drags the other day, and I picked up both adults and nymphs. So this is a time that you have to be aware. This is a peak period of time for exposure to occur. I'm not going to get into this slide, especially because half of us can't actually see this really kind of complex slide here. But what I wanted to get at is the, the danger of the nymphs. The nymphs feed on infected mice. They then drop off. The nymphs are already infected. That small life stage, they're ready to go, they're ready to transmit. The next, what they're really looking for is a larger mammal. Well, you're a larger mammal and you ran across their path. So they don't know the difference between, they're not going to turn you down. They're going to get on you, and they're going to bite you. And, it's a, and we'll talk about attachment time. But the longer they're attached, the higher the risk for you goes, it goes up. 
So this is just something to think about. Of course, the, fe the adult females are really important, but it, we believe it's the nymphs that are causing a huge proportion of the disease. And if we, you know, a lot, you know, we always talk about the deer and the impact of the deer. A lot of this has to do with the mice. Um, we have all set up our yards in certain ways. I have big wood piles in my yard. I know that there's mice living in there, so I, I keep them as far away from my house as I can stand, you know, so I can go out and get the wood. But I keep them pretty far away from my house. Um, and I ensure that there isn't a lot of other areas for the mice to nest around my house because I don't want to encourage more mice. Um, deer control is a big topic and it's something that I'm not going to talk about today, but mice are a real problem and you'll see why. Um, how do ticks get on you? You would be absolutely surprised and I'm sure most of you know this in this room, but how many myths and misconceptions there are about ticks? Ticks fly. They, no, they don't. They don't fly. They don't jump. Uh, they don't drop from above, they crawl onto you. So they are constantly, they're up on a blade of grass doing this. They're waiting until you just brush up against them. And I go out and I flag. Flagging is basically me tying a stick to, or it's, it's a dowel. And I tie a, um, a white cloth to a dowel and I drag it across a yard or, or an area and I pick up ticks because they're instantly latching onto that and then they start burrowing right in. It's a great way to know if you have ticks in your yard, and it's how I collect them and how other people collect them as well. Um, and that's how they're getting on to you. So it's an important thing to know where they are. Unlike mosquitoes, which I started with, mosquitoes fly. It's a very basic concept. You have to enter their territory for them to get on you. If you don't enter their territory, they're not going to get on you. But that's really hard to do in Massachusetts. So Lyme disease. So this is, you know, I can put up a map of Massachusetts, and I'm going to, and it's going to show you that Lyme is everywhere. But I have found this to be a much more efficient tool at telling people how much risk they have. Look at the Northeast. It is absolutely covered in Lyme disease cases. We are the area that is most impacted by Lyme disease. The majority of the country does not experience what we do. So, we have a lot of travelers that come into our state, they go back home after being exposed and their physicians don't necessarily know what they have because they don't see this. This is something that we have to live with and we're trying to figure out better ways to manage that risk and educate the public so that we can reduce the burden. This is a CDC graph. Um, graphs are always fun. Um, you know, it's late at night. So from 1997 all the way up to 2017, look at the rise in cases. Part of this is an artifact of surveillance. If you look for something, you're gonna find it. But look at the rise in cases. They started at about 12 and a half thousand. Well, they're over 40,000. We firmly in Massachusetts believe we are undercounting cases. Um, we have stopped the, the type of surveillance that we, we had been doing for many years. And that's why if you go onto our website and you say, hey, where did the last four years of data go? Well, we don't do data the same way anymore. We're looking at new ways to collect data so that we can more accu accurately represent how many cases we get. It just is disingenuous to continue telling you you're only getting 5,000 cases a year. It's not true. This is the map of Massachusetts. It's usually a much nicer shade of green, but um, Lyme disease is everywhere. Even where it looks like there are a few cases, it's everywhere. And up here is where we are, and every single, and I'll show you again and again, it's going to be hard for you to see, but uh, Carlisle and the adjacent areas do have a higher incidence of all of these tick-borne diseases. And a lot, of, a lot of this is the type of habitat that's here, uh, and the age demographic as well. So there are a lot of different uh, variables that play into this. This is Massachusetts. All I want you to do is ignore the case counts. There's a lot of them. We talk, keep talking about 60 cases of mosquito-borne disease a year. And again, I, I am the guy that thinks mosquito-borne disease is important. Well, I'm telling you that we had almost 6,000 cases back in 2014 that we recorded. That number is probably undercounted by a factor of four. So we're probably talking about 20 plus thousand cases a year. So Lyme disease, people, 
in the Northeast people in Massachusetts, they know Borrelia burgdorferi. They may not know a lot of other Latin names, but they know that name because it impacts so many of us. That's the spirochete that's responsible for this disease. The deer tick is the vector and the white-footed mouse is the reservoir. And we'll keep seeing this over and over and over again. Lyme disease early symptoms, you might get an e, what's called an EM rash, an erythema migrans rash, and it could look really, really nice. I'll show you a nice picture. If I think it's nice. I had a really great one. I never took a photo of it, and it bothers me today. Um, it appears 30 to, three to 30 days after the tick bite, but not everybody gets this rash. And if you do get it, if the tick was on your scalp, you may not see the rash. If um, I, my wife actually spotted one on my back, but I would never have seen it. So if you don't have a partner who's attentive and looking at your back, then you're gonna miss out on a rash. Um, if you miss the rash, there's a host of other symptoms that come with Lyme disease. Uh, Flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, fatigue, neck stiffness, achy joints, I had all of those today. So we all feel like this from time to time. The key is, when? Do you feel like this during the spring, summer months? How long does this go on for? When should you see your doctor? And we're going to keep coming up with the same nebulous symptoms, flu-like symptoms, fever, headache. If you get these symptoms during transmission periods, you need to go see your primary care doctor. Tell them that you live in, an, you know, if, if they're listening to you, you live in an area that's endemic with ticks, get tested, and continue to follow up with them because sometimes the early tests are negative. So this is an EM rash, if you can see it. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but over here, you can see almost that perfect little bullseye rash. But some of them don't look like that, and some people have multiple rashes, and of course, other people have no rashes. Later symptoms are unpleasant. You really don't want to let this progress into the later symptoms, and they can. They can include severe joint pain, degenerative issues, in, including arthritis, um, and then very seriously, heart damage. There can be, we've had individuals with AV block, and you know, they, there are very significant heart issues that can be associated with Lyme disease in the later stages. There are effective treatments for this, early treatment, early detection, that's really what's necessary for Lyme disease. And this shows you the time of year where we're seeing the most cases. It's exactly what you would expect, except you see that there are cases every single month. Well, why is that? Well, some of these are later identified, and some of these are people wandering into the brush during the middle of the winter, developing rashes and flu-like symptoms. Don't forget about your pets. Your pets are bringing in ticks as well. I have two dogs, they're corgis. They're about as low to the ground as you can get. They're like little sweepers. They bring anything back in with them and then they shake off and the ticks go flying. Now you're in your safe spot, your home where ticks don't exist, except they do. And that's when people let down their guard. So just be aware that owning a pet has some risks as well. And even if your pet is treated, this is an interesting graph, and if you care about graphs like I care about graphs, I find this to be one of the most fascinating graphs out there, especially for Lyme disease. There's a reason. We tend not to see this type of peaks. This is an age distribution graph. So we're, we're asking who is most impacted by Lyme disease? Well, children. Um, why? Because of their activity. These are kids, they run into the woods, they go do things, they run back in the house, they don't bathe as frequently as we would like. They wear the same clothes too often. Um, I tell parents frequently, when your kid of a certain age within this five to 14 age group comes in and they've been in a tick endemic area, grab their clothes, throw them in the dryer for 15 minutes, kill the ticks, and then make them take a shower. And it's gonna really dramatically drop the risk of them developing Lyme disease. This is in addition to tick checks. Who else is at risk? And I say this with all due respect for who's in the room, the elderly. I Believe me, I'm on an upward trend towards the elderly. I'll be there in no time. So I'm going to be in this category at some point. It's our immune systems. Unfortunately, as we get older, our bodies don't work as well as we would really like them to. Um, and many of us retire and we have more free time. So when we have more free time and our immune systems aren't working as well, 
gardening actually turns out to be one of the highest risk uh, activities that you can have because you're now doing exactly what you should be doing, enjoying your time, but you're out in the yard where the ticks are, often on a fence line, that's where you're picking them up. So we target those two demographics very differently. Oh, and that's all the ticks that are all over the place. So I wanted to talk again about babesiosis, and then the other one I really want to talk about is anaplasmosis. But babesiosis is one that not a lot of people hear about, but it is a very important tick-borne disease. Uh, babesiosis and all of the ones that so far we're going to talk about, these are all bacteria. So these are, these are organisms that can be controlled by antibiotics. There are some other diseases that we'll talk about that are viruses, so you can do something about these. Again, look at it, deer tick, white-footed mouse. So you have the vector is the same and the reservoir is the same. We keep hitting on this. And we should also think about co-infection. These ticks can have all of these diseases at the same time and they can transmit them at the same time and they do. We have, um, we have mechanisms to detect co-infection and we find them. Uh, Babesiosis is a very different disease. Um, it can be very serious. The incubation period ranges from one to nine weeks. Most people have mild symptoms or none at all, and they do clear this. Um, but if you do have symptoms, again, fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, but it can progress into things like um, dark urine, vomiting, abdominal pain. And the elderly, the immunocompromised, those without functional spleens, those are the individuals who are most at risk for this disease. It can be transmitted through blood transfusion. So in the Northeast, the blood system is, supply is checked. This is where babesiosis is in the state, but look here again, you are right in another hot spot. So Carlisle again in this area is getting hit with babesia, but it's really the Cape and the Islands where we see the most transmission. And these are our case counts, which are fairly accurate. So we're getting right now about 600 cases a year, which is huge. Um, what I want you to focus on is time of year is the same for these diseases, but look at the graph below where you see the age distribution. Kids are absent. So it's really an immune system issue with Babesia. Um, we're not really seeing as many children with this because they clear the infection on their own. It's not that they're not getting exposed, they are. Anaplasmosis, another bacterial disease, and deer tick, white-footed mouse. But for anaplasmosis, the deer tick can also act as the reservoir as well. So they don't even need the mice. They do need them for some of it, but they don't need it for all of it. So you get that added benefit there. The only nice thing about anaplasma is that on the bottom there, it's treated with the same antibiotic as Lyme disease. So if you go in, you get tested, and you have both, or they miss one, it can be treated with um, the same antibiotics. Um, the incubation period is one to two, two weeks. Again, it's mild symptoms or none at all in most people, but if you do get it, fever, headache, so we keep saying the same thing over and over again, same symptoms, fever, headache, muscle aches, uh, but progressing to nausea, vomiting, and this can be very, very serious, especially in people who are immunocompromised. They already have something going on with their system. Um, and the most severe complications are in, again, older age group or those people who delay treatment. It gets worse the longer this goes on for. This is uh, anaplasma. I'm gonna throw that back up there. I put it in red, you know, because the map is pink and that worked out well. But look at where you are again, the exact same problem. So this is an area that keeps coming up with a lot of tick-borne disease. And Here's a trend that you really don't want to see. So this is anaplasma in Massachusetts. This is not a surveillance artifact. These are true cases. We've seen our case counts rise precipitously. We're now getting about 1,200 cases a year. Anaplasma is a little bit different. Every single year we see that peak in October. We really don't, are not 100% why. We've got many, many theories, but we're not completely sure why. But a look again at the age demographic, same exact thing, older age group, these are the people who are getting it. And then I'm only gonna spend a minute or two on Powassan because I know I got all excited about mosquitoes. Um, Powassan virus is something that's been in the news lately and anytime something's in the news, people get really concerned about it. And you should be. Powassan virus is very, very different than our other uh, tick-borne diseases. 
It's spread by the deer tick, of course. Um, the symptoms, if they develop, can be severe. Most of the cases who are exposed, they don't exhibit any symptoms. But the symptoms include fever, headache, confusion, and this can develop into meningitis and encephalitis, a very serious disease. What's really serious about Powassan virus is it has about a 10% case fatality rate in those people that have meningitis or encephalitis or poliomyelitis. Um, there's no vaccine and it's supportive care only. Um, but just to give you an idea of how few cases we're getting, 2018 we had five. So we're really not seeing, so I showed you all the way from 2013 to 2018, we're picking up more cases but we're looking more and we're not seeing a huge number of cases. What I thought was really interesting, and I bolded it, was the ratio of men to women. We look at every statistic you could imagine at the State Health Department, and one of them is called a sex ratio. For most of our tick-borne diseases, males are always a little bit more impacted than females because we have more male outdoor workers. Um, but for this one, we've had the vast majority are men, and we don't know why. It's probably because of a small sample size, but we're really not sure why. It's just something I thought was fascinating. Um, month of onset falls into line with most of the others, but it can also extend into the fall. And the last one we have is Borrelia miyamotoi. So again, this is another Borrelia species, and there are other Borrelia species out there. Same tick, Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick. Uh, the reservoir is mice, again. And I'm gonna move on to my next slide here. We lead the nation, just you know, just so we can take credit for this, we lead the nation in the most Borrelia miyamotoi cases. So we're really happy about that. Um, we just made it newly reportable to the state health department, so if you get this, we find out about it and we can do something about it. Uh, but we've had about 78 cases, and you can see the sex ratio of about 52% male is exactly what you'd expect, and it follows the same patterns as Lyme disease. So very, very, as far as there's almost no mortality or no mortality that we're aware of with this one. Um, but there has been one hospitalization, no fatalities. It's a pretty low level disease and it can be treated. And then very, very quickly, I'm just gonna skip through a couple. What can you do? Repellents, 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 repellents. I don't care if you don't like repellents, use them. There are many repellents, you can grow to love them. Um, there are all different repellents and they, and they work. They will repel ticks and mosquitoes. Um, you do need to conduct tick checks. I do some field work here and there. Every time I get out of the vehicle, I do a tick check. Every time I get back, going back into the vehicle, I do a tick check. Um, showering soon after being outdoors, and then wearing, you know, we used to say a couple of years ago, you should wear long sleeves and long pants, and this is when it's like 100 degrees out. And there was, it, was, it was silly, because we're telling this to kids. Kids who walk around in shorts, you know, in 20 degree weather, so we changed our messaging, but realistically, if you wear light colored clothing, so I can find the ticks here, I'm gonna have a hard time finding the ticks here. So think about what you're wearing out, and then if you wear um, the same clothing to do, I throw on the same clothing to do yard work, um, and always call your doctor if you get a fever or rash, always. But if you wear the same clothing outside, consider using permethrin on your clothing. This is a, um, a caricide which will kill the ticks and it binds to your clothing. So it's something you would never spray on your skin, but for those of you who don't wear repellents as often or you forget, spraying it on your pants, your boots, it'll actually kill the ticks if they get on your clothing as well. So it limits the potential for them to actually infect you. DEET is still recommended, but there are many other repellents out there that work very, very well. There's, they're on our website. Um, Always remember, don't apply these to the hands and face of young children because they'll put their hands in their mouths. And then basically this is, on, follow the manufacturer's directions. They're on the can and only use EPA approved products. Daily tick checks are absolutely important. I don't want to minimize the value of these because I just told you that the tick that you, you can't see, you know, but I can't minimize that because there's the adult phase and I found uh, nymphs on me as well. So checking along certain areas is important, but basically um, UMass had uh, a small interesting study for one of them. They found that oftentimes the ticks are attaching where the clothing meets the skin. So I've found them on my ankles after I do yard work and I've found them on my neckline after I've brushed against trees. So really do a complete check. Um, 
face it, we live in Massachusetts, we have to deal with this. So you really have to do a very, very thorough tick check in order to detect these. And believe me, I have found ticks in places that I am not going to talk about today. Um, and I have removed them successfully. Um, you see that um, nice man in the picture examining the woman's hair? My wife does that for me, and she picks ticks off of me, and she's a wonderful person for doing it. But I would not have been able to find these ticks if she didn't do that. So having a partner to do those tick checks and just asking them and you know paying them off, bribing them, really works well. So the, one of the last things I'm going to talk about is tick removal. Um, I have been absolutely surprised by how many different ways people have come up with to remove ticks. If you go onto the internet, which you should never do, um, just don't do it. Uh, they have, if you look at YouTube, there are things on there that nobody should do this. Um, when I was younger, they burned the ticks off of you. That was the way to do it. Um, you were a man. But no, use fine tip tweezers, grasp down at the base of the head, pull straight up. If you leave the head in there, no problem. So just wash the area. If you want to apply antibacterial ointment on it, cover it up, your body's going to reject the head. The bacteria is held in the mid gut. So this is the gut of the tick. If you break that tick open, you're pouring out the contents of this, this tick onto an open wound that you've created as you're doing these activities. Don't suffocate the tick. Don't induce flame to the tick. Just pull straight up with fine tip tweezers. If you don't have fine tip tweezers, go buy some fine tip tweezers. Um, the good people all over, a lot of the uh, municipalities actually give these out. Uh, some of the, uh, the devices to remove them work really well, and others are kind of gimmicky, and you should just be careful about which ones you use. I just keep fine tip tweezers everywhere. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about is, a lot of people ask this question, how long does a tick have to stay on for me to get sick? And it varies, but generally speaking, if you remove the tick within 24 hours, it re vastly reduces the, the chances that you'll get a disease. The shortest period of time you can catch anaplasma is about 12 hours. The shortest period for Lyme is 24 hours. And the shortest for Babesiosis is about 48 hours. So if you get that tick within tw 24 hours, at least you have a really good shot of not contracting these diseases. Don't forget, if you see, get a fever or a, or a rash, go see your doctor. Um, the only one I put on there, which I feel like I have to do, is Powassan virus. It can be transmitted in as little as 15 minutes, so it kind of breaks down this entire argument. But since only five people got it, let's just use this. So tick-borne outreach, I have, a, I have an entire section of tick-borne outreach, but since I've monopolized the floor, I'm really not going to go into it. But we have a lot of resources. We're doing really engaging efforts at the state level to target youths. Um, so we're really trying to knock this back because it's such a huge health burden to members of the state. But we do have print materials. You can order them for free. Tick cards are our number one resource and they will show you. And I know our, our good friends at UMass, they have, they have a way better tick card than we have. You guys have more money. Um, but theirs is uh, see-through. So ours is just the standard paper. But this is what we have available. Um, all of our links are active on our web website. You can get, see all of this. You get more information out there. And if you ever want to contact us, we have a 24-7 line. We'll talk to you about these things. You can call us. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions, too. So if you have questions and you write them down, I'm not going anywhere. I'm really interested to hear our next speaker. So oh, this is my, one of my units. I'm not going to talk about it. because I, I put it up there in case I actually have time. So, I'm transitioning. Okay, our next speaker, thank you very much, Matt. That was wonderful. Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Charles Bradley. Uh, he's been pract a practicing uh, veterinarian for 35 years with a background in large animal medicine, veter veterinary consulting, feline practice and now has a general small practice in Concord. He is a 1983 graduate of Ontario Veterinary College and has been in Massachusetts since 1985. He currently owns and operates a small clinic in uh, West Concord, lives in Carla with his wife, his two cats, and thank you for these details, Charles. Cats' names are Rosie and Cosmo. That's right. There we go. And his elder dog, Frank. 
He has seen a lot of tick-borne disease with his work in Concord and in many practices in Eastern Mass and in Southern New Hampshire. He is very excited to talk to you about his experiences and his own data that he's collected in his practice. All right, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Jean. I'm Charles Bradley. I'm not a professional speaker. I don't know how to do PowerPoint. So uh, this is a first time for me. So I'm really excited to talk to you about what I talk about every day. So I'm going to pretend that this is an exam room and there's only like two people in the room. So let's get started. Actually, I want to ask a few questions. How many people have a dog at home? Oh, OK. How many people have cats at home, right? Any horse people here? No? OK. So I will have a word for horses afterwards. So tick, mosquito, tick and mosquito diseases, this is mostly a tick talk. I do have one mosquito-borne disease that's very, very important. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So that's Frank. He's an elder dog. And uh, I want to talk to you about Frank later on. He has taught me so much about Lyme disease and anaplasmosis over the years. Frank and I lived in Ontario with the family, and he was the only dog that I found positive for Lyme disease in southern Ontario while I was there. Uh, it was a real stark difference. You looked at that map earlier. There's an incredible difference in the incidence of these diseases as we go throughout the country and the continent. This is Cosmo as a kitten. He's well named. He is a crazy cat, and I'd like to talk to you about him a little later on. Cosmo is an outdoor cat. He brings in ticks and all kinds of stuff. And we're going to talk a little bit about him as an example of feline uh, tick-borne disease. Risk factors. That's the entrance to Toll Field on the lower right. And the upper picture is my yard. And basically, you see a leaf litter. The pets go out there. The people go out there. They get ticks. I mean, that's just the reality. We find ticks every single month of the year at, at our animal hospital. Uh, Frank just came in with a tick after a, a quick walk uh, earlier this week. They're there every single month of the year. All right, so that's a, that's a key thing. So this innovation, the SNAP4DX by IDEX, was probably the way that we as a veterinary community found out about tick-borne disease in dogs. I don't know if anybody remembers back in the day when you go to get your dog to have a heartworm test once a year. And usually you would do it in May, April, and we call that heartworm season. So IDEX came up with many buttons. There's several blue dots on that test kit. And the way that it works is you put a drop of blood into the top here, you snap it down, and then you'll have the answer of whether the, the pet has any of the four diseases. So the 4DX stands for the heartworm test, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and ehrlichia. So we can derive a lot of data, uh, and we do have some data to share a little later on. So historically, April and May, now I want to just debunk that heartworm season thing. That is really old school. We check dogs every single month of the year. We see an uptick in the number of dogs that come to see us at this time of the year. But heartworm should be thought of as a, a year-long disease, and I'll get into that later on. PCR polymerase chain reaction panels. That's a big boy test that costs a lot of money. It's the only way that we can find Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And sometimes we'll have a negative 4DX, and we don't know why the dog is still limping. So we will do the PCR panels. They run about $200. So that's pretty pricey, so that becomes a practical limit. So the ticks that we see, we saw this earlier, the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis, that's the big one. That is really responsible for a lot of problems. I do see the American dog tick, the brown dog tick rarely, and we have seen Lone Star ticks, and I've got some pictures. These are great pictures because they are provided by Dr. Michael uh, Dryden. He is the guru of tick-borne disease in America. He's out of Kansas State University and he shared these images with the Lyme Disease Subcommittee for educational purposes. So the deer tick is everywhere. The deer tick is absolutely everywhere. I've heard it said at some of my veterinary talks that the deer tick displaced the uh, dog tick 
in, in Massachusetts. I've heard up to 50% and more of the deer ticks carry Lyme disease. So the 45, 50% rate here in Carlisle, that really resonates for me. So Lyme disease and anaplasmosis. Anaplasmosis is really coming on. We don't see very much Lyme disease in our dogs anymore in my practice, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a bit. That's the engorged deer tick. It really often fools you. I was working in Ontario, as I said, for one year in 2009. A lady brings that tick in, and she says, I think it's a deer tick. I said, no, no, that's not a deer tick. They have a completely different system there. They send the tick into the veterinary laboratory for identifying what's in it. And sure enough, it was Lyme disease. It had Borrelia burgdorferi in it. So you can get very confused on ticks depending on whether they're engorged or not. Uh, so removing them from pets, that's the key thing because it's the time of attachment. That's my thing. I really think it's the time of attachment. So we have to get rid of these ticks and we have to have some strategies. And we'll talk about that. That's the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis. Uh, it used to be more common, as I said. It can transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, ehrlichiosis. Sometimes I'll go through stretches where that's all I see, and I don't see a deer tick. I think about a year and a half ago, for three or four months, every tick that we pulled off was a dog tick. I don't know why. It's just a very interesting anecdote. I'm giving you a very, like, seat of the pants, empirical uh, talk because I live in a clinical world. So I'm just giving you some of my observations as I go along here. The brown dog tick, look at that engorged female. That is amazing. That is, that is a tick that can live inside the home and it is responsible for Ehrlichia and Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. The Lone Star Tick, yes, Ehrlichiosis, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. Uh, Stina, who's uh, with me, she's a veterinary technician and she's my wife. And we saw a dog on a Saturday afternoon. The gentleman was visiting. And he said, I don't know what this, what is this dust on my dog? And I said, I'm not really sure. This is kind of strange. And we dusted the dog and all this dust came off the dog. It was a long haired dog. And Stina said, well, wait a minute. There's specks on that dust. And they were Lone Star Tick larvae. And the gentleman was from Long Island. And that's the only case of Lone Star Tick that I've seen locally. Tick attachment, that's a picture I took at my clinic. And I'll tell you my way of taking ticks off. I just developed it as I went along. What I do is I put a drop of alcohol. I have alcohol in every of the, one of the exam rooms. I just put a drop of alcohol on the tick. And then I take a needle driver, which would be a very fine tweezers, basically. And after the tick has been uh, imbued with alcohol for, say, two or three minutes, or maybe at the end of the visit, if I remember, my technicians will say, hey, Dr. Bradley, what about the tick? And then I just kind of tweeze it out. And I'm very successful at getting the mouth parts out. The mouth parts, it's not vital to get the mouth parts out, OK? Those, that little island of red will stay there. I looked at a dog this afternoon. It had the same thing on the muzzle. And I thought, oh, that dog probably has like a, an abscess or, or some kind of a tumor. But I could realize, I put my head loop on, I saw that there was just tick mouth parts inside that area. And that's OK. You can leave those mouth parts there. And that, that's called a granulomatous reaction. So it's a bunch of cells that form like a, a raised plaque. And you can just treat that locally. As long as you get the tick off, it's good. So Lyme disease in dogs, I'll give you my take on Lyme disease in dogs. It's caused by the Borrelia burgdorferi bacterium. I find that the clinical signs of these tick-borne diseases in dogs has a lot of overlap. So if I call up uh, Mrs. Jones, I'll say, so. Your dog has now tested positive for Lyme disease. We have different levels of understanding. We, we do a Lyme C6 quantitative antibody, which is a measuring of the titer. But I basically, I try to figure it out based on how the dog is doing. And they'll say, well, he's a bit lethargic. 
And it's a funny thing, whenever I touch him, he's very prickly. And, or he's off. And I will often get, like tonight, I had a dog that was triple positive, Lyme disease, uh, ehrlichiosis, and anaplasmosis. And that dog had a really stiff neck. So, you know, they're, they're tentative, they're sore. And Lyme disease is a chronic disease. It takes at least 21 plus days for it to transmit to the dog or for the disease to manifest itself, if you will, for them to become seropositive, which means to show uh, antibodies. One of the greatest tools I have is I give them doxycycline. If these dogs are sick, some of these dogs have a deficiency of doxycycline, I give them the doxy, 24 hours later, they're, they're really much better. And that's a really good thing to, to have because most of the time doxycycline is fairly cost effective. And sometimes I have to use response to treatment as one of the test uh, methods. Diagnosis can be really, really tricky because we don't really have a good way other than doing the PCR test, which checks for genetic material, a, a, a cost-effective test that can really tell us definitively that the dog has Lyme. Lyme nephritis, has anybody heard of that one? That's a bad one. Lyme getting into the kidney. That's almost always fatal. I haven't had a case yet, but it's, uh, the Lyme causes an immune reaction in the subunits of the kidney, and the kidney can, can be taken out, and those dogs usually die. Anaplasmosis, that's one that I see more often than Lyme, and I'll get, get to that in a minute. It's the anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Clinical signs very similar to Lyme, some of the subtleties about anaplasmosis in my practice would be that a lot of times the people will call back like three months after the diagnosis and say, my dog is limping or my dog is just a little bit off. I'll look in the notes and I'll see that the platelet count, one of the things that we do is we check a platelet count and if the platelet count is kind of borderline, we try to figure out whether this is a real infection, and we might say, okay, it's not a real infection, but yet three months later the dog gets sick. Then it will respond to doxycycline. Again, it's doxycycline that, that treats it. Um, sometimes those dogs need uh, 60 days of antibiotics. Uh, 30 days is the standard treatment plan for both Lyme disease and anaplasma. So it's a lot of work, right? You're, you're giving your dog 60 administrations of an antibiotic to do one month, that's a heavy lift. If you do two months, it's 120 times you have to pill your dog. So that's a lot. So uh, it is more frequently diagnosed in Lyme and we're building this case. Lyme disease needs 24 hours plus in a dog to cause disease. So Lyme disease needs the deer tick to be attached for about 24 hours plus in order for the uh, the, the Borrelia burgdorferi to get from the tick into the dog. Anaplasma, three to six hours. So we'll talk about that as we go here. Ehrlichiosis, I see it, I get positives. Dogs are, are, it's almost the same thing as anaplasmosis and they can stay positive for like five years. They can show antibodies for five years after infection. So again, doxycycline. Rocky managed spotted fever. It's rarely diagnosed. I need a $200 PCR t uh, test to, to diagnose that. So I don't know if it's here. I would love it for it to be a 5DX and have that on the button, but we don't, we don't have that. Uh, that is a little bit different disease. It can cause rash, rashes, fever, bruising, vague signs, as well as the lameness. Okay, here's my thing, treatment. I think many veterinarians do a wimpy dose of doxycycline. I do a big boy dose. Uh, one of my things that, one of the things that I did in my career is to be a consulting veterinarian. So I was in 40 different, 40 plus different animal hospitals. Some were specialty centers, some were emergency centers. So I picked up a lot of trivia, factoid, anecdotal information. And the thing that I retained was you need a 10 milligram per kilogram twice a day dose. So that's a very big dose, and I want to knock those organisms out. And I will get animals that will test negative after treatment. So that's my thing. If you ever are worried about dosing, 
you usually get a dramatic improvement uh, in 24 to 48 hours. Side effects, not that common surprisingly. Uh, you can get vomiting and diarrhea sometimes, but usually the dogs tolerate the doxy very well. And we went through a period when doxycycline was very expensive. It was costing two and three hundred dollars to treat a dog, but now we're down to reasonable rates under a hundred dollars for even the bigger dogs. So duration of treatment, 30 to 60 days. That's my finger, same picture Matt showed, tiny, tiny organisms. So Lyme disease needs 24 hours of attachment, and a plasma or a lichia only three to six hours. I find that the worst months are March and November for ticks. Just really crazy the number of ticks that we see in November. They're always there. They're just always there. There's no tick season. Okay, let's talk about the old school preventatives. Most people still use these. Uh, there is no such thing as a, a repellent or a bubble of protection. Every tick preventative in a dog requires the tick to bite the dog. I don't know of any way to get the dog to have a bubble. If anybody knows, let me know, because that, that would be what everybody would want. Um, the repellency is poorly defined. There's different standards on what is a repellent. What does it really mean? Will the tick be um, uh, repelled, or will it mean just two hours of attachment? attachment versus 12 hours. There's lots of controversy on that. The brand names that you'll hear about are Advantix, Frontline Plus. Uh, those are the big two. We used to carry Frontline Plus. I don't think it works anymore. Frontline Plus is a real legacy product. The thing we've also found out about the Frontline Plus is that's the one where you have to put the liquid onto this dog's skin. And a lot of people said they didn't like it because it's gooey and messy and they were concerned about their children getting in contact with with that liquid which is a chemical so you know that made sense but i only know that after we got into the new preventatives the collars they're good and they are an adjunct but they don't kill ticks until 24 hours so that's a problem i don't know of any holistic or natural methods i would love that but i don't know of any so the new preventatives, I like those. Isoxazoline oral medications. Big FDA warnings out on the internet. There is the actual FDA warning. And the big thing that they're worried about are tremors, ataxia, and seizures. So we have had one or two cases. We've been using it since 2014 where dogs sh had shaking and tremors. Or the, it might have caused them to be a little unsteady on their feet, which is what ataxia is. But I think generally they're very well tolerated drugs. I only know NexGuard. I used to know them all because I was in different places, but I'll speak to NexGuard. They're so confident about their product. That's a Bollringer Ingelheim product. We just got a briefing. They have a label claim against Lyme disease now. So if you use that product, they will say that Lyme disease won't come to your dog, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Brevecto, Semperica, Cordelio, they're the other brands. Here's the, here's the take home point. Most of the ticks are killed within 12 hours. That is incredible. Think about it. Uh, Lyme disease needs 24 hours of attachment. The tick is going to fall off at 12 hours. That's a good thing. Where do you get the information? So a lot of this is out there in the internet. But I like to, to send you to sites that are, are legitimate and not selling you anything. CAPC.org, Companion Animal Parasite Council, that's a great place to go. And they have incidence maps, and you can see that the shaded areas are where Matt's shaded areas were. So CAPCVet.org. You should really rely on your local veterinarian, too. The veterinarian really knows what's going on in your town, in your location. He knows your family, he knows your dog. That's a great relationship. And I'm gonna plug that relationship because you should buy your preventatives from him or her. You should maintain that record, that conversation. That is so key to us helping you guys because that relationship is what is going to generate information and it's gonna generate good health. 
There's a little website that IDEX offers too called the Pet Health Network. I do believe in vaccination. Does anybody have a dog that's vaccinated for Lyme disease in their room? Okay, good. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that we can do, right? We, we're trying to prevent Lyme disease in our pets. We don't want to have live ticks in our home. So the three pillars of prevention for Lyme disease would be tick removal, if you can find the, the ticks. They're so darn small. Preventatives, I think that's key, and vaccination. Side effects of vaccination, that used to be a big concern. Dogs would go home really sore, lame. They would tremor. I don't see that with the vaccines that I'm currently using. I think that they work. I always tell people 80% effective. I know that they don't last more than, the immunity is probably eight to 14 months and it's arguable. So I would say that yes, you should do it. There's cost to it. Everybody's going to think differently about things. So we always have a conversation, we tailor it to the family and to the pet's needs and the risk. Okay, here's the data I wanted to present. Uh, we tried to partner with IDEX. They have all the data on all the samples that we've sent from, from our practice. We started in 2013 and we would have maybe 200 dogs that came to see us in 2013. It was just really the beginning. And all I did was I would hand out Lyme, uh, doxycycline. Doxycycline, doxycycline, every dog had Lyme disease. So I said to one of my technicians, can we find out about this? So we went into our database. We have a practice management uh, database that collects all of our data. And we were really shocked at how Lyme disease went down. If, I'll just explain this chart, but you can see the number, you can see the colors. Lyme disease is blue. Anaplasma is the one that jumped up a bit. And Ehrlichia is the one that's at the bottom, the green. So Lyme disease went from 10 to 1%. That means that 10% of all clients who came to see us in 2013 had a dog with Lyme disease. Now it's 1% of clients have a dog with Lyme disease. And I, 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 it's just observational data, but I think it's because of the, using the oral preventatives. Because most people said, hey, I like the oral preventatives. And I was surprised because I was thinking, around here, nobody's going to want to put a medication into their dog. Nobody's going to want to put a chemical into their dog to kill ticks. And they told me, no, we want to do that because we don't want to have ticks. We don't want to have that greasy chemical stuff on the back. And we can never get that frontline plus down to the skin anyway. So the oral preventatives are incredibly easy. You just give the dog the preventative and you're done. Do it once a month. So that's pretty dramatic. Now you see the anaplasma. It didn't really go down the red line. The anaplasma is a three to six hour tick uh, attachment before transmission occurs. So the oral preventatives can only kill, uh, say, by 12 hours. So the line went really a lot down uh, much more rapidly compared to the, uh, the other. Ticks, pets, and people, just some reminders. Cats in the bed, dogs bringing ticks inside. We've talked about that. They're everywhere year-round protection. OK, I'll talk about Frank, how he taught us quite a few things. So Frank, one time, we did a blood test on him, and I think it was the anaplasma. I did a CBC, a complete blood count. He was positive for anaplasma. And then I said, oh, well, what does that mean? I better do a follow-up test. So I did a complete blood count to check his platelet count. And it was about 200,000, which is totally adequate. But my threshold is 200,000. If they're under, I get suspicious. If they're over, that's just me. And I said to my family, I said to Stina and Kelsey, I think he's fine. And they said, no, you're wrong. <laughs> I said, OK. <laughs> Well, what do you want to do? Let's try him on doxycycline. Oh my gosh. We gave him doxycycline, 24 hours, he was like a brand new dog. It's like he had lost five years. He was really active. So this is really confusing even for the veterinarian. And as I said before, Frank was the only dog who found Lyme disease in Ontario. And he convinced the rest of the 
uh, veterinarians in that practice to do 4DX testing on all the animals. And a year later, the guy calls me up, my colleague, the other veterinarian said, hey, Charles, I'm sorry we, we made fun of you over that 4DX, but now that you convinced us to do the 4DX, now we're starting to find Lyme disease. So Frank was influential in ways he didn't understand. <laughs> so that cat there is Reggie. We called him the Duke. And he was a really good guy. He would go outside and he would harvest ticks, just like Cosmo does. <laughs> and he'd bring them into the house. And uh, we, you know, we thought that ticks in cats it wasn't a big deal. But it turns out that uh, cats can get anaplasmosis. And we will treat cats for anaplasma. I've read that they can do Ehrlichia. They're very resistant to Lyme, but there is some thought that they might be getting Lyme disease too. Again, doxycycline. If you have a cat that is taking doxycycline, please don't give it the tablet. Because the tablet, unless you really crush it, it can cause an esophageal stricture. So you have to be very careful with doxy in cats. Just an anecdote. Ticks. Okay, there's my eldest daughter, Paula. She's a veterinarian now, actually. She helps me at Domino. And she uh, could tell you a lot about tick-borne disease. That's Pedro. And in this area, I do have some information uh, on my cell phone if anybody wants to talk to me about horses afterwards. But uh, it's not really well known whether a positive uh, test means disease. It's the same dilemma in small animals. But in this area, we do treat uh, horses for uh, tick-borne disease, uh, particularly Lyme. We treated our pony with IV oxytetracycline. And I had to go with the needle five days in a row. I can tell you by the second, third day, when the pony saw me coming with that needle, <laughs> I needed help to get that into the, into the vein. Okay, let's talk about heartworm to finish up. Most common mosquito-borne illness of dogs, Massachusetts is endemic. That means that they're, we're in the red zone. We, have, we do have heartworm, it's not a scam. My experience in the central mass, okay, so in 1980s, when I first came to the States, I worked in uh, Athol and I worked in Gardner. We had two practices. And I used to have people say, Oh, no, I don't believe in heartworm. I don't think that that's, that's right that you sell that stuff. That's a scam. I'd say, okay, could I just take a blood test then? No charge. I'll just take a blood test. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. So I'd draw the blood, and I would go to the back and put a drop of blood under the microscope, and I would look at, at the sample, and half the time I could see the little larvae, the microfilaria, swimming. So I'd say to the lady, okay, could you come back to the lab? She'd look down. And that meant her dog needed heartworm treatment. That was a sad time. Back in those days, to prevent heartworm, you had to give the pill every single day, the filera bits. And if you didn't give it every day, if you missed a day, the dog would get heartworm. So we're so far ahead now. And I wonder if we have herd immunity. I wonder if we have so many dogs in heartworm preventative that we've been able to drive down the, the reservoir. Because the reservoir is any canine. So a mosquito takes a bite from an infected canine and takes the mosquito, the mosquito transports the larval form into another dog. If your dog is on heartworm pills, your dog won't get it. So the life cycle is such that if you give, say, a heartworm pill on September 1st, you're protecting against what happened in August. So I had a guy one time, his dog got heartworm because he did the six month heartworm season, but he had the wrong six months. I tested his dog and had heartworm and he had bought the heartworm medication from the veterinarian. So those secret guarantees were actually invoked. And the company, when, they, when I called up for support, they said, did he buy the heartworm pills online or did he buy them from the veterinary hospital? He bought them from the veterinary hospital. So he got $250 towards the treatment and he got a year's free supply of meds, and they said it was his fault, but they would still support him. So that's why I want you to think of heartworm as a, a year-round uh, problem. We are in the zone. If I showed you that zone in 1985, the red would go way, way up into Massachusetts. So the bullseye is Arkansas and Mississippi, the lower Mississippi Valley. 
So if your dog is spending any time in the south and you think you have a six month heartworm season and he's traveling with you, you might get a bad surprise. Heartworm prevention year round. We do that annual heartworm test every single month. I don't like the injectable ProHeart 6. That is probably needs some more time to be well proven. I know that there were some problems with it before it was introduced many years ago. Can I tell you about the treatment? It is horrible. We had a dog called Stella who came to see us and that was one of the most helpless feelings I've had in my career as a veterinarian. I gave her the injection. It's an arsenical. It's based on arsenic. I gave the injection into her muscles and then I had to give it the next day and she was in utter agony. I've never had anything like that. Uh, I, I can't even tell the story because I couldn't do anything for her. I tried all the, all the pain meds and all I could do is just, she just went home. So prevention, no treatment. That must be the end. <laughs> Thank you. Charles, that was very interesting stuff. Like oh, front line, you know, like you're right on the front line of everything. So we, um, since it's really not a huge group tonight, we could actually just take questions. We initially were going to have index cards just to keep it more orderly and kind of compile questions. But if anyone has any questions for either of our speakers tonight, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, I know I have a couple. Okay. Well, yes. And I'll I... repeat the questions. Oh, my question is. <coughs> Um, for humans, I think, um, I'm hearing about all these other treatments that are offered besides antibiotics that will help to make the recovery process more effective. It, it, is this true or is the, that a lot of just hype out there? Um, I don't think that's in the scope of this talk tonight. I think if, if anyone has any yes. questions specifically for Charles, I don't know if you okay. want to address that. He did mention holistic um, yes. methods that he was not familiar with. And so I don't really have any answer. do you have any comments? And, um, no, that's OK. Did Matt already leave? No. Where is he? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Are you familiar with Are you familiar with alternative treatments? And I, I know a lot about that stuff, but I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, I'm not a clinician. Yeah. So well, we don't need to take the time. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. No, okay. We do take the time, so it's best to talk to your doctor. There are a lot of options, but your doctor is probably the number one person that you should chat with. About. I'll need to locate a doctor that is actually knows something about Lyme yeah. or is willing to work with it. Yeah. Um, the gentleman, oh wait, I'll get to you next, Bonnie, and the gentleman in the back. Yes, so I played in the woods all the time when I was a kid. Never saw a tick all my life until maybe 15 years ago. What happened? Why weren't they around then? Why was there no disease then? And what's happened that has made this so epidemic? Such a, such Matt, would you like to talk to that? Do you want to use the microphone? Sure. Okay. There, and, and I guess follow up. Is there anything we can do about getting rid of them other than these ridiculous pesticides? No. <laughs> why, why don't I just get right to it? Uh, when I was younger, we had uh, the most abundant tick was the dog tick. And um, that, that's just the, how things have been. It's clearly transitioned over to the deer tick. We're not completely sure why. There are certainly um, ecological reasons, climatology reasons. Uh, why this tick is um, now the predominant tick. There's um, certainly uh, an abundant source of mice that carry uh, all of these different diseases that is part of the reason, but there's a lot of research going on to, to better understand why we have so much uh, disease in Massachusetts. If you look at the range of Ixodes scapularis, the tick that causes the majority of our illness, what you see is that the range goes all the way down into the Florida, all past the Carolinas, but you don't see Lyme disease really cropping up at all to the extent where it does here in Massachusetts. So the tick is present, uh, the populations are present, but the diseases themselves, they're not as present. 
So I think that I would have to say overall, we're not still sure why that these are trending upwards at such a high rate. And as far as control goes, ticks um, don't fly, which is, again, what we get back to. Um, control is labor intensive and expensive. Um, that's why you don't see more control going on. And realistically, um, pesticides are an option. Uh, it's very difficult to control them. You can certainly co control them from um, a land use perspective, uh, but also if you think about it, the population in Massachusetts has changed. Um, our land use activities have changed. That there's, this isn't one thing. This is a variety of different things and probably land use and population density have a huge role in the impact of this tech. Just quickly to add to that about tick behavior, um, there, there was a conference I attended recently that discussed the differences in behaviors of the Ixodes scapulars tick in the south versus the north. Uh, apparently, um, ticks in the south, because of the heat, and Matt had mentioned before, they do not like dryness. That's their enemy. And if you keep that in your head, that kind of helps guide you in terms of your activities. Um, these ticks in the south hide in the lower leaf layers, so they're less, much less likely to attach to you as you're walking by. In the north, where we are, our ticks are very friendly, and they hang out near the top, so you're much more likely to be um, bitten. So even if the pathogen burden in each of these ticks is about the same, there's a difference, at least in that regard. Um, that's kind of interesting. Sure. Um, there are lots of uh, vendors around that spray a cedar oil The question is about cedar oil and does it work? Do either of you have any information on that? We're on film still, right? Excellent. So I'm putting DPH's perspective out there. Um, any oil will work. So what you're really doing is you're suffocating the tick. So ticks are hard-shelled bodied, so you can actually apply any oil to the tick and you'll suffocate the tick. There's a repellent effect. Uh, you know, DPH doesn't administer pesticides or any oils or anything like that, and we don't advocate one position or another. Um, the consumer is welcome to take whatever service they want. From a research perspective, yes, cedar oil does act as a repellent. Is it efficient resource for your, your hard-earned dollars to spread cedar oil all over your yard? I think that's a decision you'll have to make but you could use a bo bottle of canola oil to, um, to suffocate ticks. Uh, so there are, there are benefits to cedar oil, but there are certainly, um, there's certainly a money-making perspective from these companies. And, and again, this is up your, how you decide to spend your money. Yes, it would work, but so would a lot of other oils. And we would not usually disperse olive oil in this manner either. <laughs> How long does it take to count 40,000 mosquitoes? <laughs> well, we stopped after 12 hours and we came back the next day, and then we stopped after that 12 hours and we came back the next day. So it took us about three days, but thankfully they were mostly the same species. So, and we had several helpers, but this is in addition to our normal workload. So. <laughs> So I, I have a very quick clinical question for Matt. I don't know if you have this information. because Still not a clinician. There, I know you're not a clinician, but you may have access to data that I'm not aware of. So in the medical literature, there's really not much written about Borrelia miyamotoi. Um, I have patients with it, and they don't seem to manifest the same symptoms. It's primarily cardiac and autonomic, um, your, your nervous system. <coughs> Do you have any information about the clinical disparities in terms of presentation? Because most of us do not have access to testing for Borrelia miyamotoi. It's right. usually at specialty labs, and even that is not easy to do. So um, it's a little labor intensive. Do you have? We, we haven't seen a huge difference in the types of symptoms for these cases. There but might be overlap. Right. There's a lot of overlap. And also because the testing is not uniform throughout the state, there's probably a lot of uh, cases going undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So the amount of cases that we have is actually too small for us to really make a hard make and fast it. decision. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bonnie. I haven't heard a single mention of climate change. Now, when I moved here in 1966, there was no such thing as a deer tick at all. And my husband died 
of anaplasmosis in 2012. And everybody that I've spoken to says climate change is part of the picture. The warmer winters allow the ticks to live. So and now they're even in Canada. I, I'm going to make a comment just quickly about the warmer winters. Warmer winters don't necessarily actually translate into tick um, populations dropping. The colder, wet, heavy snow winters, they actually perpetuate the tick's lives right. and make it more moist in the leaf litter. Right. So they actually live longer. So it's the dry summer days that but really if it's kill the ticks. freezing and dry, which it used to be, there so I don't know if you have information about the intricacies and how climate change specifically may be affecting tick populations or even disease dispersion. Do you have any yeah, comment? We, okay. so, so I'm not a climatologist. Um, you know, just to get that out of the way, like I'm not a clinician, I'm not a bunch of other things. Uh, there is no doubt that the climate has changed to a degree and that certainly impacts uh, ticks. But what we see is that Variability is the key feature of climate change. So that's what we're really looking at. And if you take one segment, one variable, and it moves out of place, it changes the entire nature of things. So it makes it very difficult to assess the role that climate change may have. But what we can easily see is a very clear upward trend in uh, warmer temperatures. That is absolutely clear cut. Warmer temperatures are associated with potentially, and warmer winters might be associated with more small mammal survival. Uh, but then there's a lot of other drawbacks as well. So it's extremely difficult to make one concrete assumption from this. But what we're seeing is earlier emergence, later um, season end points, more potential for transmission and I think that this feeds into the idea that if we have wetter summers as well, well, wetter initial periods, which has happened, but we've also had droughts, uh, it's that massive variation that used to, you know, the climate, I think, when you were a bit younger, it might have been more stable. And when I, when I was younger, the climate seemed to have been more stable. But again, I'm not, as, I'm not that old. I'm stable, 41. but with very cold winters. With very cold winters, yes. Yeah, so how does, so again, it, how did that long. impact the mortality of the small mammals that the ticks got on? Right. So there's so many different variables, but there is absolutely no doubt that it, the warmer weather is playing a role in the, uptick, in the increase in arboviral disease and uh, tick-borne disease. Right. Yeah. But to what degree, we can't really say. Uh, I was so the young lady over here. Oh, I have a question for Dr. Bradley. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he is a wealth of information. Okay. <laughs> um, and now I better understand, I think, why my two dogs got anaplasmosis after having Lyme vaccine and being on Nexgard. Is there anything else I can do, a, a tick collar or anything else you would recommend in addition to the, the next guard that I give them every month? Right, so the next guard would, would be, or any of those in that category, you could choose. Uh, so I would do next guard as the primary and the tick collar as the secondary. And I have a follow-up question. The tick, so I put tick collars on them and they hang out with my cat. Is that okay? Ah. Uh, uh, there are certain collars that can't commingle with the cats. That is a good point. Should I put oh, it on when we go out, or is it the kind of thing that should be on them? Because the cat stays inside. I suppose you could do that. And here's a, a, a dirty secret that I, why I don't like collars as well, because of the imidacloprid that they, the imidacloprid, which is toxic to the environment and kills bees. So that's why I don't ever talk about collars, usually, unless it comes up in conversation. Uh, the scalabore collars don't. Scalabore collars don't, but the Celest yes, Ceresto, Ceresto do. Does. Yeah. Ceresto does, yeah. yeah that's the one that Advantix yeah, is imidacloprid, well. too, I believe. All right. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> say in relation to that, so I have a friend who always had ticks on him and his dog, and he started using, um, made up a spray that he researched and he was using 100% essential oil of eucalyptus and lemongrass, 20 drops of each, along with an ounce of witch hazel and three ounces of distilled water. 
that summer he had had well, summer before he had had anaplasmosis, and um, the next summer when he used it, his dog had one tick the whole summer, and he was pretty clear. So I can also uh, remember the cat. I can also remember the cat that almost died of tea tree oil poisoning, mm. and uh, I was doing a shift in an emergency clinic in Springfield, and I didn't realize it was that toxic, and the cat almost died. I mean, it was tea tree oil. Tea tree oil. Yeah. Well, so. this is supposed to be okay for people, for children over two, and animals, dogs. Okay. Yes. I agree with going to your vet and getting the medication and Thank monitoring you. through because uh, the vet has been um, a great resource for us and all of our animals of what else is happening in the neighborhood because we right. see animals coming sick. Right. So he got the Eurekia, that one. Ehrlichia? Yes. Uh, Ehrlichia. That causes uh, stiffness of the neck and horses. Right. And, yes. Uh, definitely an animal's muscle. My question is, I didn't quite uh, get um, uh, your, uh, I have my dogs on um, Advantix. Okay. You said, how long does Advantix, uh, how quickly does it kill the tick on them? I understand that re the repulsion works mm. by the tick dying on the dog and just right. basically, you know, you should check the dog. And I'm pretty sure it's 24 hours plus for Advantix to kill a tick. So the uh, oral one works better than? It's faster. That's why it's more effective. It kills the tick faster, and the time of tick attachment was my point. I think that that's what we proved. It's not proof, it's, it's observational data, but we, we believe that the oral medications work faster, and the tick falls off before it has a chance to exchange from its mouth parts the organisms which live in the tick. So Ehrlichia is transmitted in three to six hours, and a plasma is three to six hours, and Lyme is 12 hours. So that's why the orals are better. Okay, and a, uh, another quick question. Um, I, I wasn't here for, for the earlier. Uh, tick tubes, do you see um, that they're working? Do, do you get any feedback about tick this? Tick tubes? Tick tubes, yes. I, I cannot there. speak to that. Because it works on the... That um, says yes. Yeah, it tick works tubes. On the mouse. So, um, Oddly enough, we have kind of a low level. We, we don't actually advocate for the use or disuse of pesticides. Tick tubes, we, um, we do not like. Uh, we don't think that they're a good idea in the environment. The mice that um, you would want to take up the, so basically what a tick tube is, if you don't know what it is, is um, it's a uh, toilet paper roll full of cotton balls that had been sprayed with permethrin. Um, these are sold at a quite an upcharge. Um, so I think the last one that I saw a box of these was about thirty dollars. I don't know if you have priced them out recently. Yourself. Yeah, about thirty dollars, and you can make them yourself if you so chose to. But we, there's a couple of unanswered questions: Are the um, target mice taking them up? What is the impact of exposing so many mice and the ticks? to uh, pesticide usage, and if the right mice are not uptaking them, then what is the alternate problem with putting them out in your yard and exposing them? So we talk about things, especially with mosquitoes, about resistance to insecticides. Um, these are classes of insecticides. If you res induce resistance to one of these insecticides, you can potentially encourage resistance to others within the same class. There's really not a tremendous amount of evidence that tick tubes uh, actually reduce the rates of transmission to humans, uh, and the burden is just quite high anyway. So there, are, there is um, data that shows that the four posters for um, deer, there is some benefit to that, but it's really ongoing. So right now, DPH really does not advocate the use of the tick tubes, and they are vastly overpriced. Can I interject another solution? I've been using Irish Spring Soap for the last five years to keep the deer out of my yard. And it's been working quite well. They break through sometimes, yes. But I figure I'm not getting that many ticks anymore. And I, you can either hang it on a tree, uh, you know, put it out now. It'll last till next spring, pretty much, even though the soap, you know, disintegrates as the winter goes on. 
um, as a bar. Some people grate it, it didn't work for me. I also put it on stakes around high plants with my lilies that I want to save. And you're change they don't like the smell of it, so you're changing their pathway. They can go to your neighbors maybe. <laughs> As long as you're driving them to your neighbors, you know you're being successful. She doesn't care about Do you feel like you have any closing comments to make, or should I? No, sounds good. Would everybody be okay with, if you have specific questions for Matt or uh, Charles, to just come up and speak with them briefly, or is there anything that anyone feels hard pressed to share with the group? Because it is kind of getting late. Yeah? I have one question you might be able to answer. Okay. If you have had, I think you wrote an article once, and it was in the Mosquito, about the bullseye rash. <laughs> that if you actually have a bullseye, it's like winning the lottery because... I might have said that. I, I, I don't, I don't. I just mean, and the point what being that yeah. it's so, you, there's so many infections that that particular symptom would be, I mean, you're lucky to get it. It shows that you've been bitten and infected, but most of the time you don't know that you've been infected. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you, if you do not have a bullseye rash, and you don't, and you've been bitten, is it possible to be bitten by an infected tick or a Lyme and to develop disease but not be actually aware of it? Some kind of chronic disease? Absolutely. The question is, can you have Lyme disease or one of these other infections? Even there are questions about chronic Powassan virus. There, there are pathogens out there that we're starting to identify in ticks that we don't even recognize as human, human pathogens. There are a lot of things out there, not to freak everyone out <laughs> before you go home, have nightmares tonight. Um, but yes, you can have chronic symptoms, not have a bullseye rash, not have typical things, even like we were talking about before, Borrelia miyamotoi can present with very atypical symptoms. Um, and it's not under your typical Lyme, even though it's under the umbrella of Lyme disease. Um, so there are different species, and each within each species there are different plasmids that code for different types of presentations. So that's a whole other talk. But um, what we'll do is convene, and thank you very much for coming. This has been really very interesting, and I want to thank our speakers. Tonight, you guys did a wonderful job. Very